Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Plenary C, Early Career Scholars Forum. Nowadays, in academia, it is imperative to be mobile. We are facing the uncertainty of tomorrow while keeping the hope for a better academic life. All of us experienced precarity at different stages, ages, and at different levels. As PhDs, postdocs, and beyond, we have the pressure to perform at any level. We have to prove that we are excellent in all the tasks we are doing. But what does it mean to be excellent, to be original in an academic neoliberal system that offers no security measures for precarious researchers and that is ready to get rid of them as soon as the working contract or funding has finished, offering nothing else than the unemployed excellency. We do have precarious lives and live in a precarious world that is characterized by accelerated changes. Life projects are postponed continuously and the end of our uncertainties are delayed and we are more, more than ever vulnerable. On the other hand, we are ready to continue this endless academic travel by accepting to work under time pressure, applying continuously for funding with no distinction between working days and free days, being always in a workaholic mood. Those affected experience precarity in an apparently endless framework of stolen time, as expressed by Shahram Kosravi in the opening of this conference. A stolen time that condemns to an almost endlessness condition of precarity, hoping to reach one day that moment of transition from being a precarious to a settled researcher. Precarity is an urgent topic of discussion, but also a topic of research that has to be analyzed from, in, from an intersectional perspective that takes gender, nationality, race, ethnicity, and class into account. Of course, there are no short-term solutions and no simple recipes. What we need are concrete actions and a profound critique of the entire system that is different from one country to another. We do also need a profound critique of ourselves, of our own choices, of accepting and being part of the system. The four papers of this plenary try to shed light on the issue of precarity in a highly contested, hierarchical and neoliberalized system. Good afternoon. When the ASA Executive Committee decided to engage with precarity in academia, it responded to an ongoing anxiety, but also an upcoming solidarization and the call for action by our membership. Since the ASA was founded in 1990, we have gone through many versions of neoliberalization, auditing and restructuring, always accompanied by protest and solidarity. Yet it seems that today we are facing a new climax, not only for endemic uncertainty, but also of projected economic and political crisis, austerity and authoritarianism, targeting academics as preferred enemy. The recent developments in Turkey, Hungary, India and the US have shown appalling consequences of a new wave of nationalism and anti-intellectualism, creating precarity for thousands of academics and damaging, in particular, social sciences and, as recently in Hungary, particularly feminist and gender studies. Georgette and I thus see our role in the ASA committee as facilitators of shared responsibility of academics of all levels and in different countries, 
and for, day, for today we invited young scholars to present their ethnographic research on precarity and we will travel from individual grief to leave academia with Clara McKenzie to greedy institutions as explored by Christian Rogler. And we will have two versions of mobility, one as an ambiguous potential with pain and another one that itself becomes an expression of precarity, as Vinicius Ferreira uh, calls it. We will have two panels and start with Laura and Martin, commented by Theodorus Rakopoulos, and a second one with Vinicius Ferreira and Chris Rogler, because there is not enough space here for all of us at the same time. And they will be commented by Vita Peacock. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker. It will be Laura McKenzie, an honorary research fellow at the University of Western Australia, interested particularly in issues of precarity, audit and gender. She did write her PhD on romantic love, gender and age, and has worked since uh, then inside and outside of universities. Laura, the floor is yours. So hi everyone, uh, I'm just going to start things off by talking about quitting. Uh, so recently there's been a fairly large amount of uh, what's called quit lit being published in academic circles. Uh, and these are statements authored by established and so-called early career uh, academics, often issued on personal blogs, social media platforms, uh, or academic websites announcing their intention to leave academia and their reasons for doing this. Uh, so quit lit, written by precariously employed scholars, generally taps into the feelings experienced around leaving or quitting academia. Uh, that is the pain, grief, shame and rage associated with their thwarted desire for an academic career. Uh, so my paper today takes its inspiration from quit lit and specifically those pieces authored by precariously employed academics. Uh, so drawing on fieldwork undertaken in Australian universities from 2015 to 2017, my analysis is centred on the most precarious academics, those holding intermittent, usually part-time roles, uh, often for several years. I focus on those uh, who have completed their PhDs, uh, who tend to rely on precarious academic work to earn a living, uh, as well as for career development purposes. Uh, so to give some context, in Australia, PhD candidates can apply for three to four year scholarships uh, to cover their living costs, which at the lowest rate pay slightly less than our minimum wage. Uh, and while not everyone has these scholarships, they do tend to mean that those doing PhDs don't need to rely wholly on precarious academic work to earn a living. Uh, hence my focus on po post PhDs. Uh, they also tend to be considered students rather than employees. Uh, in Australia, as elsewhere, uh, precarious academics commonly work as course coordinators, research or teaching assistants, uh, as well as in university administration and roles like teaching students study skills uh, to make ends meet. Uh, and most of those that I encountered didn't hold postdocs, and that's maybe something we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, they're unpaid or underpaid for much of their work and are employed on casual or fixed term contracts. Uh, so in Australia, casuals uh, work on zero hours contracts, uh, paid at slightly higher rates than other contracts, in theory anyway, so you get a 25% casual loading, uh, but have stripped back protections and benefits. Uh, meanwhile, fixed term positions attract some of the benefits uh, attached to supposedly standard continuous roles. Uh, and the latest figures from the Australian Bureau of Statistics show that right now slightly less than 50% uh, of all workers in Australia are employed full-time with access to leave and benefits. Uh, in universities, the figures are much worse. Uh, so precarious academic employment has increased dramatically in Australia over the past three decades. And at present, casuals make up about 44% of all university employees, while fixed-term employees uh, make up about 21%. And ongoing or permanent employees make up the remaining 35%. So my research was undertaken in Perth, Western Australia, and in Adelaide, South Australia. 
uh, at three public universities, active in teaching and research, as is common across Australia. Australian universities draw heavily on traditions from the United Kingdom, the United States, and continental Europe. Uh, indeed, they only emerged in the 1850s. Our system is almost entirely public, and universities rely pretty much entirely on national government funds and subsidised student fees. Uh, so my methods included interviews with precarious PhD holders um, who were seeking academic jobs or had recently sought them, uh, and mostly those on contracts of significantly less than a year. Uh, I also did some participant observation, which included attending events like uh, early career research workshops uh, and gatherings, and I examined online materials engaging with academ academic precarity. Uh, so today I'll focus on my interviews, observations, as well as my analysis of worldwide Anglophone, Quitlet, uh, particularly that authored by those identifying as precarious. Uh, though people's narratives of through people's narratives, narratives of leaving, I explore the emotional dimensions of quitting academia, including feelings of love, anger, and so on. And I ask how leaving is understood and felt by precarious academics, as well as when, how, and why people do or don't leave. So there's been some critique of the understanding that leaving an academic position even constitutes quitting. Uh, critics have noted that in the case of precarious scholars, the term quitting implies their leaving was chosen and works to deflect fault and responsibility from universities, their managers, um, as well as national governments for underfunding academic work. They argue that the authors and analysts of accounts of leaving uh, should instead speak of scholars being driven or forced out. And while I don't disagree, in my view, that doesn't account for the ways that some people performed acts of quitting explicitly to evade any future return to academia. Uh, so as one person put it, they quit to avoid getting sucked back in. Uh, my analysis of precariously employed academics quit lit uh, reveals that such statements are characterised by public claims that the author will no longer be accepting academic work, uh, as well as criticisms of their working conditions employer and sometimes their permanent colleagues. Now, given that offers of very short-term precarious work are very often highly personalised, uh, that is, they rely on the cultivation of networks and contacts with more senior academics or managers, uh, such critiques are very likely to render the authors unhirable. Uh, furthermore, I repeatedly heard stories of how precarious academics had forced themselves to leave their tenuous positions, uh, some people would move away or travel if they could afford it, uh, separating themselves from their universities and their contacts within them, uh, in order to avoid the temptation of accepting short-term work and low-paid contracts. Uh, some would simply leave their offices, never to be seen again. Uh, and a, a presentation I attended in a 2000 and, uh, at a 2016 conference, one scholar of academic work, uh, Ruth Bakan, spoke about a participant who had set up a doomsday clock on their computer, counting down the days, weeks, and months until they'd be leaving their position. Um, and it, it was therefore fairly common for people to use a trip away, a declaration, or a physical move to ensure that they did in fact leave academia. Uh, some, sometimes this was successful and sometimes it wasn't. Uh, to me, this not only points to the value of the term quitting, in describing experiences of leaving uh, that were characterised by an intentional distancing, uh, but to people's deep attachment to their precarious academic work uh, and the difficulties inherent in leaving. And so it's to an example of this that I'll now turn. In April of 2015, during a week-long mid-semester teaching break, I spoke with Tamara in my office. I tended to talk with precarious academics in my office when they worked or lived close by. Uh, most of them didn't have private offices and often told me that they were concerned about being overheard by uh, managers, peers, or more senior academics. Uh, my own private office in an empty corridor with a, a few other mostly precarious academics was an ideal place to speak. So Tamara was in her 30s, had been born and always lived in Australia, and had completed her PhD three years ago uh, when we spoke. She was educated and had worked in a humanities, arts, and social sciences discipline. 
Uh, so that day we were talking about her experiences of academic job seeking after her PhD and her transition from a precarious academic role to a comparatively well-paid administrative role at her university. Uh, following her PhD, she had undertaken work in retail as well as some occasional hourly paid teaching work. Uh, at the time, Tamara worked at the university uh, where she had received her PhD in the administration role, but she's since moved to a similar role at a university elsewhere in Australia. I asked Tamara if she'd talked about her experiences of academic job seeking with others, and she started to tell me about a group of people that she'd graduated with. So following her graduation, they would often have dinner together to complain and sometimes cry about their lack of career prospects. Uh, but eventually, she told me she couldn't handle it anymore. Because everyone was looking for work, everyone was pissed off, and it would just be a three-hour rant, she said. She told me that she started to loathe going because it was just so negative. Uh, she added that this was rightly so, because pretty much no one had found work, but that she just stopped wanting to hear because... Uh, thanks. Uh, because she needed to maintain some kind of optimism. Otherwise, she said she would have stopped looking for work entirely and spent the rest of her life working in the retail job she'd taken after her PhD, uh, selling men's designer accessories in a wealthy inner-city suburb. Uh, Tamara told me that these group dinners continued to this day and that she'd stopped attending a long time ago. I asked her about the group's response to this and to her decision to stop looking for academic work, and she told me about a recent argument with a friend. This friend, she said, had come to her new office. Uh, after arriving, he became visibly angry and began swearing to himself about the state of the university. He then proceeded to scream at her, uh, where's all this money coming from, and then he stormed out. Uh, they hadn't spoken since, and she told me now that their friendship was mo most likely over because of this. Uh, meanwhile, in an earlier conversation, Tamara had spoken extensively about her love of academic work and of teaching in particular. Uh, interestingly, she used very similar language when she was talking about her new position and, in fact, highlighted this as a reason why she'd made the right decision in leaving. So, overwhelmingly, those I encountered were dissatisfied with their career prospects and with the structure of universities in Australia as well as worldwide. Uh, reasons to leave often featured in my fieldwork, but were balanced by feelings of responsibility to students, uh, passion for teaching and research, and the idea that leaving after years spent in academia would be a waste. While many spoke about wanting to leave and gave compelling reasons as to why this would be the right decision, most were still working in universities when I spoke with them and had plans to continue publishing their research and applying for more permanent academic positions. Many still remain three years after I started the project. And even Tamara was still working on publications when we spoke, and she's just published her first book. Tamara's experiences and those of others highlight the emotions involved in academic precarity. In fact, many scholars have begun exploring academic uh, precarity as an effective state. So, for instance, Anne Allison describes being precarious as pain and longing for the ordinary, or what is seen as ordinary, uh, she asks how its affects might be deployed in a politics of survival and social reconnection. Meanwhile, Marcus Harms and others explore academics' descriptions of pleasure in their work as flow, fulfillment, joy. Rosalind Gill reflects on the shame and loss experienced in the face of individualised academic failures and rejections and how pleasure in academic work can perpetuate self-exploitation and lead to further employment uncertainty. Uh, so, to this list, I would add the anger resulting from current employment arrangements. This anger was clear in Tamara's altercation with her friend, uh, yet it's often well hidden from those who aren't precariously employed themselves, except where it's purposely deployed in genres like Quitlit, for instance. Uh, Tamara clearly found this anger to be destructive and spoke of it as demotivating, as well as having the potential to sever her social relations. Uh, yet emotions associated with precarity might be seen as productive as well as destructive. In her recent article on quitting, the sociologist Francesca Coyne writes about current formations of quitting and burnout. Uh, so quitting, she argues, is a symptom of the urge to create a space between the neoliberal discourse and the sense of self, an act of rebellion that allows those quitting to embrace different values and principles. 
The anger that becomes evident through acts of quitting therefore can be seen as challenging. Uh, while not all the stories of leaving I encountered were dramatic or clear-cut tales of quitting, such cases were a significant minority in my fieldwork and most clearly in my examination of the quit-lit genre. And here it's worth asking who is visibly quitting and who isn't. Uh, so the tales told through quit-lit privilege the accounts of those able to leave in such ways, those with some hope of gaining less precarious non-academic work who will never need to return to academic precarity. Those I undertook my research with, who tended to be on very short-term, low-paid contracts, often had less dramatic tales to tell. Their leaving went unnoticed and uncelebrated, or they left but then were later forced to return. They adopted strategies to prevent their return if and where possible, and yet stories of precarious colleagues leaving were widely and enthusiastically circulated. And they talked to one another loudly, but behind closed doors, about their anger, pain, and longing at being precarious. Thank you. I think it showed nicely how important it is to also think about the emotions in, involved in these precarious lives, particularly uh, how insulted uh, one can feel when the university does not choose you to stay and you have invested a lot in this job. So I think it was a very good start to remind ourselves about the emotions involved in this debate. Our next contribution will be by Martin Scheer, and she's doing her PhD at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. And her PhD is also uh, investigating the transnational mobility of uh, academic scholars in early stages of their career. And she's particularly focusing on personal and professional aspects of mobility patterns, social networks, and career strategi strategies from a gender perspective. So she's uh, in uh, overall uh, research, she's also interested in issues of asylum, migration policies, and language transmission in migratory contexts. But today, today she will talk about her PhD context on mobility from a gendered perspective. Martine. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm very happy to be here. So a starting point uh, of this presentation was the observation that there was a growing tendency for uh, young academics to be transnationally mobile. And while academics sometimes engage in uh, cross-border mobility to take a position of world that are particularly attractive, over the early stages of their careers, however, many of them feel that they have to comply with mobility. On the one hand, transnational mobility has become increasingly presented as a necessary element for a successful academic career. And the rationale behind this expectation links mobility with the idea of excellence in the sense that mobility would allow young academics to establish transnational networks, uh, develop skills <coughs> um, and broaden their sci scientific horizons. And in this sense, mobility represents professional and symbolic capital necessary for a successful academic career. On the other hand, uh, career paths leading to permanent positions in academia often involve a transition period of fixed-term contracts following the PhD. And in many cases, young academics might engage in mobility as a result of the increasing prevalence of such fixed-term positions and the relative decrease of permanent positions, a situation that might force them to follow academic opportunities not only within but also beyond national borders. Unlike other forms of highly skilled and work-related mobility, academic mobility is organized without institutional support and on precarious, fixed-term and lowly paid contracts. Academic mobility also triggers a particular dynamic whereby it often becomes difficult for the academics to return where the mobility trajectory started. And furthermore, and this time like other forms of mobility or migration, Academic mobility is highly gendered and has important effects in reproducing or transforming gender inequalities. 
So these different characteristics of academic mobility generate a wide range of constraints and difficulties for the academics on the move and for their partners as well. And my presentation today focuses on such constraints which relate to various individual as well as structural circumstances that are at the same time gendered and among which actors exercise a degree of choice. So for this, I draw on the results of qualitative narrative interviews, which I conducted with early career academics at the University of Zurich in Switzerland and the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA in the US. I interviewed academics that I defined as early career in the sense that they had obtained their PhDs maximum 10 years before the interviews. And when they were in the relationship, I also interviewed their partners. So the portrayal of three academics constitute the core of this presentation. They describe the trajectories of academics who experience several episodes of mobility and provide thus emblematic examples of the current and growing tendency for young academics to engage in repeated mobility. The first portrayal is about Lisa. Lisa is from Germany. After the master's, she moved to Switzerland for the PhD, and after that to the United States for a postdoc. Back in Germany, she started a new fixed-term position and moved with her husband, Ralph, with whom she had two children. And because her position was fixed-term, Lisa looked for the next job, and she obtained a professor position in Switzerland, where she relocated with her family. Ralph, however, kept his hope in Germany, and so he spent half of the week in Germany, the other half in Switzerland. And because uh, daycare availabilities did not cover their needs, ne their needs, Lisa's mother traveled every week to take care of her grandchildren. Ralph and Lisa's flexible work schedule also contributed to render such family arrangements possible. However, Lisa highlighted that she felt torn between her professional commitments that she fully enjoyed and the constraints they imposed on her family, to the point that she said uh, that she, was, she had considered looking for a position in Germany and quit her current post in Switzerland. The second portrayal is about Mary. Mary is from France. After the master, she conducted several short and poorly paid research assignments in various countries before relocating in Austria for the PhD. At the time, Luc, her now husband, looked for a job in Austria. However, he didn't speak German, and that was an obstacle, and so he finally decided to stay in France. After her PhD, Marie moved to the US for a postdoc. And the US then appeared to us as a perfect destination to be mobile together. Luc's multinational corporation in France had indeed indicated that they were willing to transfer him to the US branch. However, shortly before Marie left, Luc learned that his company had renounced because of administrative hassles with his visa. So Luc stayed in France, and he later moved on his own to the UK, where he had accepted his posi uh, new position. And when I met her, Marie was planning to join Luc to the UK and to find another postdoc there. So Marie and Luc both said that they enjoyed being on the move, they loved these lifestyles, although it implied a number of substantial compromises. However, from then on, they expected to be able to move together as a couple in order to maybe consider the possibility to start a family. The last portrayal is about Mark. Mark grew up in France, he moved to the United States to do his PhD and then to Switzerland for a postdoc position uh, based on a yearly contract. And after that, he obtained a more senior, but also fixed term position. His mobility experiences, he felt heavily affected his personal life. Well, his move to the US led to uh, his separation from his partner who stayed in France. And then when he later moved to Switzerland, uh, his new partner in the US looked for a position to go with him in Switzerland, and she found one, but in Germany. So that all the same implied a long distance relationship. Adding to this geographical separation, the instability spawned by Mark uh, contractual precarity also affected their relationship and they eventually broke up. So as time went by, uncertainties inherent to academic life really uh, began to weigh more and more heavily on Mark. 
And in this context, pursuing an academic career seem, seemed to him overly difficult to reconcile with his desire to found a family. As he was now living with his new partner, he emphasized that he was not ready to jeopardize once more this relationship and would rather renounce to another cross-border move even when that would be even when that would imply to leave academia altogether. So these trajectories were marked by multiple difficulties and challenges, and I would like to highlight a number of them. First, when Lisa applied to the professor position in Switzerland, her position in Germany was a fixed-term junior professorship, and thus, as she pointed out herself, she had to find the next job. Um, if her position had been uh, permanent or maybe just tenure track, she would have not applied to, to, to job at this point and would have stayed put. So her experience illustrates how the nature of academic position and the related reta retention policies within universities might influence academics' propensity to engage in repeated mobility. And Marie and Mark's trajectories also suggest this articulation between contractual insecurity and the need to be mobile. Second, Lisa and Ralph's experience of mobility to Switzerland was marked by biographical elements, such as being a dual career couple and having children. Organizing childcare responsibilities together with professional commitments taking place in two different countries turned out to be extremely challenging, and the intricacies of their arrangements highlight how structural elements, such as access to childcare, but also external contingencies related to professional careers, contribute to shape the contextual framework within which individuals make and implement their decisions. Mary and Mark also experienced the challenges of reconciling biographical circumstances with academic mobility. And in bo both cases, <coughs> albeit differently, their mobile lifestyles had costly repercussions on their affective lives. Mark emphasized the disruptive implications of mobility upon his relationship, and Mary's relationship with Luke withstood we uh, long distance. Uh, However, this arrangement largely resulted from external constraints, which undermined Luke's attempts to join Mary. Third, transnational mobility takes place within the context of a world dividing in, divided in nation states, and people cross-border moves are notably facilitated or hampered by state-level regulations, like, for instance, the passport and the visa system. Such policies create different mobility regimes that in turn impact on actors. Mary, who moved to the US as an academic scholar, and Luke, who wanted to move uh, within um, a private sector corporation, needed distinct type of visa, and thus were concerned by different regimes of mobility in the US, although they both were highly skilled workers and both came from the same European country. Fourth, the broader structural context not only includes regulations about visa and work permit, but also about recognition of credentials and qualifications. And moreover, linguistic requirements, as we've seen with Luke, and labor market situation also affect the actors to varying degrees. Fifth, although from an organizational perspective, Lisa and Ralph successfully met the challenge of coordinating family, mobility, and dual career situation, Lisa depicted such arrangements as financially unsustainable, unsustainable in the long run, and this in a situation where both actually had stable and well-paying positions. Other interviewees also emphasized the importance and concern of setting aside a budget to cover travel expenses, typically when they lived apart from their partners. And for academics on the move with children, they stressed that the cost of childcare, of after school or even school infrastructures represented financial burdens sometimes difficult to handle. Finally, <coughs> Many of the situations faced by the academics and their partners were articulated with gender aspects. A gender following a constructivist gender perspective allows exploring how individuals might perform German in gender in ways that reproduce or, chal or challenge gender differences. As regard their mobility configurations, the three academics were engaged in dual career egalitarian 
um, relationships. And these gender equal arrangements made it challenging for the tight partners to follow the academic primary movers. Ralph did not completely relocate, Luke renounced to follow Marie, and Mark's partner moved closer but was still apart. And gender equal arrangements are even harder to maintain when the partners have children. The most viable option depicted by Lisa uh, for the future would imply for her to adapt her work situation to her family constraints, thus making a step towards more con conventionally, conventionally gendered uh, representation about each partner's role as father and mother. Structural elements such as access to childcare and contingencies relating to work organization also contribute to unable or constrained egalitarian arrangements. Family policies and in particular access to childcare <coughs> are gendered and they reflect representation according in the wider societal environment. In Switzerland, for instance, family policies very much reflect conventionally gendered views about the sexual division of labor, which assign domestic responsibilities to women and the role of breadwinner to men. And Lisa complained about such representation that she could experience in her daily life in Switzerland regarding limited and expensive access to childcare, income taxation policies that she depicted as unfriendly to dual earner couples, and negative representations that were expressed within her wider social environment about career women having children. <clears throat> so based on these considerations, one might ask, how can academic career, cross-border mobility, and personal life be reconciled? And this is the question all three academics seem to raise in their own way. As they expressed frustration about their current, current arrangements and their desires about future ones, they echoed many of my interviewee partners whose mobility experience were often characterized by some degree of precarity. <coughs> and their narrative uh, often reflected a sense of insecurity and deep uncertainty about the future. And indeed, when mobility episodes followed one another with no satisfactory ending in sight, academics expressed the possibility to leave academia or move to a less fulfilling position. Thus, it appears that the implications of academic mobility may not only affect academics and their partners and their family, but I would argue academic institutions as well. A series of temporary contracts associated with repeated mobility might discourage academic and push them into leaving academia. Academic institution might lose important resources in the process. Some scholars have recently started to question the assumed links that tends to equate mobility with excellence. And their results raise doubts about the actual tendency to use mobility per se as an indicator of excellence. In a system where recruitment processes are supposedly based on merit and performance, one could question the imperative of mobility, as well as the name temporary nature of contracts, which appears to select individuals according to biographical and structural circumstances, and thus might fail to attract or retain academics of great value on the basis of criteria unrelated to scientific quality and merit. And with this, I end my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for this insight to the choice of mobility, but also uh, the challenges that it includes. And uh, we can keep in mind that this is still a privileged way of being precarious when uh, you uh, have a lot of support still from the different countries to move from one country to the other. We will have a second example about mobility in, in our uh, second panel, and then we will compare it also what it means for people from Asia to come to Europe and uh, have mobility as a precariousness in itself. So um, we will get comments now on these two papers by Theodoros Rakopoulos. And Theodoros is associate professor at the University of Oslo now, but he knows quite well about 
mobility. So coming from Greece, uh, he moved on to UK and uh, studied there. He then uh, had a period in South Africa and came uh, over Bergen in Norway to finally Oslo, uh, where he is now focusing particularly on economic and political anthropology and is interested in what is also, I hope, we can share with him today, uh, working on solidarity and activism and austerity. And his last book, his most recent edited volume, is on the global life of austerity, comparing beyond Europe. Theo. Um, thanks for um, two excellent papers. I'll comment um, on them, and then if there's time, I can share some broader thoughts. Um, and if not, then we'll take it to the to the end, to the Q&A. Um, so, <clears throat> um, starting with uh, uh, Lara's paper, I would like to focus on uh, the fascinating concept of living. Um, there is a difference, there's a conceptual difference between uh, uh, quitting and living, obviously, and, and to stress the living bit, the live, is to remind ourselves of the particularities of um, precarity in academia. I mean, academia is not, let's face it, let's think back to the historical circumstances that gave birth to this institution that are still very much with us. I mean, this is not the open market of the um, um, turbo capitalism, all right? I mean, this is a medieval institution that lingers on with, the, with some very medieval labor values. I mean, there's apprenticeship, there's loyalty, there's um, um, a sense of uh, building, if you will, um, which make do for the making of a very intimate economy. Uh, within this intimate economy, there's uh, obviously the evocation of an array of emotions that you allude to in, uh, in the whole uh, discussion about either leaving or quitting or both. So, for example, Tamara talks of uh, love and of passion uh, for what she's doing, especially when it comes to teaching, which is a relation, the, the most relational aspect of what we do. But then again, everything we do within universities and in places like these, like conferences and, and the like, is relational by definition. So the idea of leaving rather than quitting is the prevalent one here, uh, because it um, is by definition um, taking us back to uh, how this is a, um, operating, everything we do is operating on a relational labor basis um, that reminds us of the intimacy of relations at large. I mean, you leave uh, your partner, you leave a, a relationship, you leave a, your, your, the, the person that you've spent some time with, you don't quit. Um, it is personalized by definition. And um, if I'm allowed a, a drop of poetry here, I mean, Sarah Kane, the, 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 one of the most important playwrights of, of recent times, sadly uh, but, um, committed suicide, um, talks about le what, what happens when you leave a relationship. Um, you have invested so much in, in the other that a part of yourself is going away um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a degree of um, um, trauma that is somatic uh, when, when you walk away from uh, a relationship because you will never get that part of yourself again. You would be mutilated forever, so to speak. So this sense of um, abandonment that is uh, corporeal, if you will, I mean, it's, um, it, the impossibility of establishing uh, relations for long, etc., and that also obviously speaks to um, uh, to Martin's paper about well, that that stresses mobility uh, more is important. Uh, I mean, um, I, as mentioned, I'm, an, I'm primarily an economic anthropology, and um, in the deindustrialization literature, um, both in sociology and anthropology, there's a lot of debate about um, the emasculating sense of leaving the machine behind. Um, so the, the relational aspect is not a monopsony of academia, obviously, it's just that here is more pronounced, but indeed it's um, a sense of uh, trauma than when you're um, made redundant, and you're leaving the factory, there's something of you that, that stays with the 
inanimate object that, that you have been working with for so many years of your life. Um, now, I work in uh, Sicily and re more recently in Greece. Um, in the idea of precarity and the precariat, before Guy Standing made it into an academic concept, was an emic idea, very popular with uh, many social movements in, uh, in the mid noughties early noughties even, in uh, Italy, mainly in the north, um, uh, where I remember going to dem demos um, where the, uh, there was a banner with the San Precario, this, um, uh, this saint that, that, that is actually, um, uh, that wears a McDonald's t-shirt and, and is, um, you know, is the same patron of all these, um, these new um, <coughs> precariously employed uh, workers. So in academia in particular, going back to the relation a bit, you leave behind a relationship or, or, a, or a, indeed a hub or a nexus of liaisons uh, who made you who you are. So uh, the living bit is um, an existential, um, uh, com there's an existential component to it. Um, um, whether this is privileged is, uh, is an incredibly important discussion that we can talk about uh, later, and it brings me um, to uh, Martin's um, paper. Uh, the privileged aspect here, I mean, is foundational. I mean, that's where we begin. The conversation shouldn't, shouldn't end there. That's my opinion, at least. I mean, especially in these, and it's particularly um, uh, significant that both of these papers are focusing on um, or inspired by um, two places, uh, two political economies that are by far the most stable in today's world. I mean, this is an extractive economy, Australia, that is, has been shipping basically um, uh, first materials to China, has been moving what uh, global capitalism for quite a while has been, hasn't lived really the effects of, uh, of, of the crisis. Also, we think in the rest of the world. And, and Switzerland is, you know, it is Switzerland. <laughs> um, an incredibly uh, privileged place where um, academic wages are, if I could use the term obscene, obscenely high. Um, and uh, it's at once a very insular and a very cosmopolitan place in, in, in the middle of Europe. And indeed, I have Swiss uh, friends in, in academia that have been um, telling me that uh, mobility is actually incredibly um, needed in that, uh, in that environment. So it's asked for. Um, people, are, uh, people in academia are sort of um, encouraged to uh, acquire this symbolic capital, as you say. Um, now, this professional symbolic capital is, uh, is an interesting place to start, but I think it's particularly useful that you give, vo give, you give voice to the partners. Again, bringing it to the relational already, um, to the relational bit, um, and, uh, and shows us the deep intimacy that is uh, taking place in what is already an intimate economy that these people uh, experience in academia. The biographical circumstances that you bring forward remind me of something that we could talk about further, and I would like to hear more, about um, the, how this operates transgenerationally. Uh, so a memory of biographical circumstances of mobility. I mean, um, you mentioned that I've, I've, I had the uh, great privilege or great uh, a greatly uncomfortable position of, of moving quite a bit to get a job, but I mean, m my grandfather left. I mean, I come from northern Gre uh, rural northern Greece, where the, I mean the whole province was evacuated after the civil war, and I have family in Australia, South Africa, Canada, the U.S. I mean, we we have. I remember growing up speaking on the phone with Toronto more than with Athens. Um, so. Um, there's this um, intergenerational sort of deep memory of moving in, spe in specific places around the world. I would, I would think in the majority of the world uh, that stays with certain people that, and also it, and trivializes what could be seen as a trauma of mobility elsewhere. And I'm thinking uh, with the established new hierarchies of political economy in Europe that 
this degree of the need to, to, to be mobile and the trauma that it accompanies it is reaching certain places like the UK or Germany or Austria that maybe did not have that so um, intimate sort of uh, uh, memorial relationship with it. Yes, there was, of course, there was German mobility to the US, but in the late 19th century, not in the 1970s. Um, so this, this kind of uh, memory within the household that stays uh, in, uh, in, in the household narratives and trivializes that kind of uh, mobility. Um, the idea of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of, of mobility as an acquired professional symbolic capital I found in, uh, in my own fieldwork when I mean, one of my uh, first interviews, uh, a person from uh, anti-mafia cooperatives told me, ho fatto la mia esperienza all'estero, that's how he started the, con the conversation, as in, I, did my half I have done my experience um, abroad, and I've back come back to Sicily understanding that the mafia is something we have to fight uh, against. So often, oftentimes people outside academia indeed um, stress that as a, it's often an, an ideological skill, it's not a real skill. I mean, of course, people know that they have to fight the mafia where, where they come, but when the, because of the whole um, narrative structure of the job market, um, they have to address that bit as a skill when, when, they, when they do come, um, come back home. Um, but I think I'm out of time, am I? Thank you very much, Theo. So we wanted to make sure that the individual papers also get enough attention and give now the two panelists the opportunity to briefly react to Theo's comments. And we will have 20 minutes at the end for also for the discussion with the audience. So after the second panel, we do the same thing twice and then we will have, have still enough time to discuss with you. Okay, it, the floor is again yours and I don't know who, who wants to start. Actually, I guess I should. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, thanks. Yeah, that was. Uh, it's interesting you used the analogy of relationships because that was what my PhD was on. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I think maybe picking up on some of the stuff you were saying on mobility, um, just because I maybe didn't, and, and you were saying it mainly in relation to Martin's um, work, but. Um, I didn't really cover it in my own talk. Most of the people I was talking with uh, were actually pretty immobile. So they were very much the ones who were in their departments um, doing kind of bits and pieces of work um, for 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 kind of contracts or hourly paid, that sort of thing. Um, and in Australia, there's not a lot of um, postdocs really available because there's a huge gap between what you get as a PhD student, which is not very good, um, and what you get as a postdoc, in theory anyway, um, it's more than three times as much salary. So I think because of that, a lot of the funding gets funneled towards PhDs, not postdocs. So that's where the kind of bottleneck of um, pe like people's careers kind of stop at a kind of post-PhD level rather than postdoc level. Um, so, uh, anything else I wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, just that uh, because of this, people tended not to, they tended to exist within the same department quite most of the time. There wasn't a lot of exchange, especially in the kinds of universities I was looking at because um, Perth and uh, Adelaide are both like smaller, have fewer universities, so there's not a lot of exchange between them. Um, often there'll only be one department in the state, even if there's four universities. Um, so you can't really move across that easily. Um, and because of that, uh, I wouldn't say loyalty, but um, sort of staying in the same place was quite common. Uh, and I mean, it's funny because... Uh, I'd, I w yeah, I really wouldn't say that people felt loyal towards their department because they didn't feel that their departments were necessarily very loyal to them. So part of it was sort of trying to detach themselves from other people in their departments and they kind of, that was where like not, not being celebrated when they left and came back was kind of a, a thing. They, 
they didn't necessarily want to engage with it because they didn't really feel like there was anything to celebrate. Um, so yeah, I might leave it at that because I think I've probably taken up my time. Yeah, I think we can look up to get back to that later, I guess. Mm. Okay. So maybe, because I'm not so familiar with the trauma concept or like that, I'd, I'd rather pick on the, you mentioned at first the, uh, the privileged situation of these academics, right, compared to, and that brings me to, to two comments. First, I think that it's interesting to take precarity as a notion, uh, as an referring to a subjective experience, right? The concept has quite much evolved since the beginning it was used. And now you really have authors who define it as a subjective experience and who also um, comprise in it uh, all a, a psychological dimension in it. So this is interesting in the sense that then it's not referring to something objective, but really to the subjective experience of the actors. <clears throat> and then about their privileged situation, I think it's interesting to show also that highly skilled mobile people are, are not frictionless, like it was maybe a decade ago, I don't know exactly how much, but like it was assumed. Uh, with this great divide between migration studies and mobility studies and the idea that privileged people had uh, frictionless mobilities and the other were really hampered. And it's, I think, always nice to try to, to combine the, 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 re, the, the theoretical results of these two fields to be able to, to, to go more into the detailed mechanism of what is at play, even for highly skilled people when, of course, objectively, <laughs> That they are in a much more privileged position that, than many other people who migrate or who are more, more mobile. Yeah. And I will yeah. give the other. Thank you very much. So they will come back for the final discussion. We just have to change the floor for now for the next group of our overall panel. Okay, uh, welcome to session two. Uh, I'll just uh, start it off quickly by introducing uh, the first speaker of this session, Vincius Ferreira. Uh, he is a PhD student in social anthropology at the Ecole des Hautitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. His thesis focuses on the circulation of South Asian social scientists in Europe, with a special focus on the UK and Germany. He is a member of the Executive Committee of the Commission on Migration of the IUAES, and he is also the founder, founder, founding mem uh, editor of Novos Debates, the student journal of Brazilian, the Brazilian Anthropological Association. So I give you the word. As academic mobility becomes one of the watchwords of contemporary scientific policies, Universities and research institutions in the global north adopt new strategies to attract so-called talented foreign scholars. In this context in which historical intellectual circulations between Europe and its former colonies are threatened and resignified, a growing number of South Asian researchers are recruited as postdoctoral fellows at European academic centers. At the same time, such institutions are reshaped by pervasive managerial practices based on the notions of flexibility and accountability, which are translated into the proliferation of short-term contracts as the dominant model for the recruiting of their academic staff. This paper explores the experience of continuous and indefinite mobility Again, amongst South Asian social scientists who seek to build an academic career in Europe with a special focus on Germany and the UK. Drawing on ethnographic work and in-depth interviews, this paper addresses the relations between mobility and precarity in the actualization of post-colonial relations through the lex lexicon of globalization. So I would like to start with an ethnographic example of the institutional discourse on mobility as an asset. By describing my encounter with the head of the department of a prestigious and wealthy institution, 
who expounded to me her perspective on the contemporary circulations of South Asian social sciences in Europe. Since the institution in which she's employed is in itself a hub of such circulations, and, a high, uh, and with a globally diversified staff in charge of teaching and supervising an equal international and wealthy body of students, we gradually approach more pragmatic ethnographic questions in the matter of recruitment. At the same time that she follows with a widespread discourse on originality, publications, teach experience, and networks as key elements for their choice, she writes down a list of elements taken into consideration by the committee in charge of hiring new staff. Figuring at the top of the list, one can read publications, exposure, and mobility. Clearly concerned with being as precise as possible, she established a descending order of importance in her list, and she underlies mobility, saying mobility is extremely important, and the Indian researchers are incredibly mobile. This is something we really value. Now, I would like to explore the narrative of Sunyu, a postdoctoral fellow affiliated to a prominent and well-off institution in Germany, who I met in 2016. Having built a trajectory between South Asia, England, and Germany, where he studied, conducted field work, earned diplo di diplomas, and taught, his main aspires in his 30s a permanent job as a researcher. His daughter and his ex-wife live elsewhere in the world while he struggles in Germany to conduct research, trying not to think, what, uh, try not to think about what his life is going to be like in two years. Yes, I would say we should be careful to say this, because academic, academics like traveling. They are intellectual people, they like to be in different spaces and Let's be clear, there are different kinds of mobility, right? Having said that, ultimately, I do think we are the precaria. I do think. The people who have permanent jobs now, they are in aristocracy. Mobility, mobility, mobility. It's mobility for precarity. They have to be this kind of detached mobile workforce without any future, right? The discourse on International mobility, as one realizes, is a very tricky one. To travel around the road, to be a cosmopolitan person, and to conduct research in well-funded libraries and are certainly experiences sought by academics. General funding uh, for fieldwork, intellectual tradition, cool websites, big words, innovative excellence, global, cosmopolitan, etc compose a powerfully attractive scenery for so-called young scholars seeking for so-called opportunities. And this takes specific forms in a post-colonial context. My interlocutors were trained as scholars and forged as individuals through an, imagine, an imaginary enormously nourri nourished by long-lasting historical connections between South Asia and Europe. In this context, what this account stresses, like several others I came across in Germany, is the existence of a progressive appropriation of this imaginary on mobility and in his historical circulations by institutions and agencies in the creation of academic field based on short-term contracts and precarious jobs. Besides, and this is crucial in the case of South Asian scholars, we see a recent growing of investments in the creation or expansion in Europe of Anglophone area studies institutions that have furthered this short-term contract model by attracting foreign highly qualified researchers. Especially in Germany, the low probability of staying is not only due to the quasi non-existent available positions, what is of course uh, a problem faced by locals too, but also because of the lack of integration of these Anglophone centers with the broader German academia, as many of my interlocutors state. Let's listen to Sonali now. 
She comes from an, an, uh, an upper middle class family. Her parents are both uh, medical doctors. And she studied in the best American universities. In the last year of her postdoctoral fellowship in a reputed British university, where she lives with her husband and son. Uh, so, although she knows little about her future, Sonali expresses a big deal of her awareness regarding her condition of class through the idea of privileged precarity. So, I think about precarity all the time, and I experience it all the time. On the other hand, I also know that I have been very lucky, and it's often how inequality in the workplace actually operates. Which is to say that at any, give, at any given moment, you think of yourself as, well, this is not my ideal position, but at least I'm lucky to have it. And so most of the positions I had are very much along those lines, that actually in many ways are the best of precarious positions. Indeed, precarity as a form of economic and even subjective relationship is not new, as some authors have correctly stated. However, Sonali's narrative points out a particular transformation regarding precarity. Today, precarity affects everyone, even those groups who historically could build a life project based on a certain level of certitude regarding their future, such as middle-class origin academics. But the role played by the idea of mobility here is twofold. First, this idea of privileged precarity has to be seen through the lens of highly prestigious international networks, which, are, which at the same time are built on a logic of international mobility that, as I said before, fits very well in a process of precarization. If academic careers are, as we know, largely based on a complex amalgamation of charisma and hierarchy, for my interlocutors, this condition of precarity abroad might, might mean a dependency on existent power relations inside South Asian networks of established academics in Europe. And such networks are more often than not caste, caste class, and gender biased. Secondly, in terms of how people build life projects for themselves, geographic mobility has been historically associated with social mobility. What many of my middle-class interlocutors express, however, is the fear of a new kind of downward mobility, as some people, as a, as some people uh, said. For example, one of my interlocutors talked about many people he knows that teach full-time the, full the whole year around and still live below the poverty line. So, I taught a strategy of, to myself. It has been important to me to recognize that this is what the majority of academia looks like, but also to kind of, in some way, shelter my own kind of psyche from such a thing. It makes, if it makes any sense, which is to say that I have developed a much deeper skin over the course. If you are interested in, in the formation of subjectivity, it's a mechanism to, in some way, kind of cope with it, right? But cope with it in a way that it's not, that to me doesn't feel deranging or debilitating or doesn't, I mean, because basically there is a way in which one lives in constant fear of downwards mobility. Such as the majority of my interlocutors, Sonali was born into a middle-class family, what in India means to be an economically privileged family with stable jobs and life projects. In India, the middle class is very often, is often very, very anxious about being settled. And it's a word that they use in English, no matter what language they spoke in the home. So that's a kind of anxiety that I think you could not be middle class in South Asia and then not kind of experience in some extent. This uncertainty regarding future is a notable difference from my elder interlocutors, who had their PhD awarded up to the 80s, and who talked about their prospections at that time with great easiness. Uh, 
The present generation live in a historical context where for the first time the possibility of building a career in Europe is, is possible. And what was not the case for earlier generations who faced an academic, uh, more hermetic academic milieu, but were at the same time belonging to these Indian or Indo-American middle class networks does not assure the socially promised stability anymore. So uh, I would like to conclude uh, to propose some preliminary ruminations on how contemporary scientific policies actualize a post-colonial history of circulations and resignify geopolitical asymmetries. First, uh, such transformations articulate both institutional and subjective dimensions by appropriating a post-colonial imaginary in which certain South Asian, well-educated, anglophone middle classes are deeply embedded. If precarity does affect everyone, locals and foreigners, it does so in different ways. Not only within the creation of scientific policies specifically conceived uh, to attract these people, by taking profit of historically established network and imagin imaginaries. Also, the way how the different generations signify their trajectories, for instance, by means of different lexicons, is expressive of such shifts from the post-colonial to the global or transnational discourse. Whereas those who went to the UK between the 50s and the 80s employed a remarkably post-colonial grammar, independence, national project, the return to India, etc. Those who left from the 90s on see themselves as part of a transnational generation. Whereas the first see themselves as post-colonial subjects, the later identify themselves as global citizens. Precarious indefinite mobility becomes a sort of proof of cosmopolitanism a new way of describing oneself in such historical intellectual circulations. It's not by chance that such transformations start in the 90s, in India, uh, sorry, it's not by chance that such transformations started in the 90s, which is also the period of new liberalization of India, marked by privatization, the reduction of in public investments in higher education, and the precarization of Indian academia as well. At the same time, that moment inaugurated novel dynamics of the academic relations between these, these two regions, India and Europe. Today, not only Europe invests great sums of money in the expansion of centers on South Asia, but also the Indian government itself invests millions of pounds in the most prestigious British institutions in the setting up of centers and chairs specialized in Indian society. On the other hand, for those who find themselves inside these dynamics, it implies an everyday and delicate work of self-reinvention in relation with imaginaries, familiar projects, and the place that one attributes to oneself inside this post-colonial transnational landscape. Many of my interlocutors end up, for instance, going back to India, where a growing market of private education grants them well-paid jobs. Others, however, have joined a new wave uh, towards newly founded and wealthy universities in the Middle East, Singapore and Shanghai. It is this new, geo this new geopolitics of knowledge, this actualization of post-colonial relations that funds in part these precarious academic mobilities. In this context, the circulation of these highly qualified workers represents the circulation of a set of capitals, economic, cultural, linguistic, intellectual, that circulate with them and become a valuable asset for so-called cosmopolitan institutions and departments. Thank you very much for, uh, I think this presentation also brings us back to the question of mobility and also illustrates the precarity created by what your informants refer to as the indefinite mobility. 
as well as a tension between the recognition of privilege and the experience of precarity and fear of downward mobility. And I think it also brings us into questions about historical circulations and post-colonial relations, as you touched upon, which is very interesting. Okay, so now we continue with the second presenter, Christian Rogler, uh, who holds a PhD degree from the University of Vienna. His dissertation, dissertation analyzes the working conditions of early career academics in the contemporary ne neoliberalized university using the cases of two anthropology departments in Austria and Denmark. And recently he has been working in administrative positions at the Austrian Federal Ministry of Science and at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. So, let me start by saying that I feel extremely honored and privileged to be able to share some of my research with you today on a matter that I feel to be an important one. I wish to thank the organizers and you, my esteemed audience, for giving me this opportunity. This introductory remark is more than an expression of gratitude and courtesy. It is part of the problematic of academic precarity that I want to talk to you about, a problematic that I explored during my fieldwork at two anthropology departments in Austria and Denmark in the period between May 2012 and June 2015. Preparing and presenting a paper is work. For some of us, that work is recognized as such and paid for by the institutions that employ us. Meanwhile, others re receive little or even no money for presenting their research. They might even have to pay the conference fees travel and accommodation costs out of their own pockets. I assume for most of you, this circumstance is not particularly odd, because this is simply part of what we need to do to justify calling ourselves academics and to further our careers. However, as I aim to show in this paper, the circumstance is highly problematic in today's university context. In that context, on the one hand, you have a traditionally greedy work ethic that assumes exceptionally high commitment, including an indifference to long working hours and the remuneration they provide. And on the other hand, there are intensified performance pressures, as well as insecure employment conditions, a combination that turns academic work into an increasingly precarious and exploitative endeavor. We are supposed to pursue our work with a fair amount of, amount of enthusiasm, irrespective of our position in the academic arena. This expectation spans from well-paid senior academics to poorly paid junior academics, and it is placed on us by our superiors as much as we place it on ourselves. For example, a postdoc explained to me, I'm changing my employment position from being a fully employed researcher and teacher to being an external lecturer who only has to teach. I'm only going to be paid for a maximum of 100 hours per semester. I'm probably going to work just as much as I did this year. I'm going to be here every day. I'm going to participate in all kinds of meetings. I'm hopefully going to write. My work is not going to change a bit. I'm just not getting, going to be paid. People who are employed in a situation like me have to keep performing as if they were employed. Her view was confirmed by a more senior colleague who told me that postdocs are supposed to behave as if they're permanent staff, but they aren't. Actually, that's how you build a career. You act as if you're permanent staff, although you aren't. You teach a lot, you play a prominent role in departmental life, and then you publish like hell. In that regard, another postdoc reported that her superior told her that she would have a long range of obligations. And she said to me, but at the same time, you have this wonderful dissertation with all these fantastic ideas you should remember to publish that also. And I asked, okay, how do I do that if I'm supposed to work at least 50 hours a week or something like that? She said, I think you should take Sundays off and you could work then. That is so hardcore, take Sundays off, like take them off, spend them with my family. But no, in order to publish my PhD. Already a hundred years ago, Max Weber proclaimed that anyone who does not have the ability to put on blinkers, as it were, and to enter into the idea that the destiny of his soul depends on his being right about this particularly conjectural emendation at this point in this manuscript should stay well away, away from science. Without this strange intoxication, without this passion, one has no vacation for science 
and should do something different. Weber's assertion still holds true in the contemporary university context. For example, a professor explained to me the crucial role that displaying high commitment plays as a selection criterion for a PhD position. To me, it's important that a person is buzzing with motivation and ambition. People have to have this drive from the very start, this will to do this. In reality, having an academic career means sacrificing a lot on a personal level. Not minding that and being ready to do that is a very important prerequisite. In other words, displaying passion for science means more than simply being enthusiastic about one's work. It also requires being willing to make personal sacrifices. The same professor described those sacrifices. There are people who want to live a comfortable life. They do their job and go home at 5 p.m. and have every weekend off. That doesn't work in academia. On the one hand, it's a matter of working hours. 40 hours will never be enough for sure. In practice, you're engaged in your job day and night if you're doing it right. Long field works can be positive as well, but they are not easy, of course. And for some, an academic career means sacrificing a relationship. The notion of an academic career as a calling rather than a nine to five job resonates with the concept of greedy institutions. By greedy institutions, we mean organizations and groups that make total claims on their members, appropriating their personality by demanding total commitment and loyalty. Unlike Goffman's total institutions, they do not physically separate their members from the outside world in order to gain con total control over them. Instead, greedy institutions rely on voluntary compliance in order to elicit total commitment. They aspire to present themselves as highly attractive to the disciples so that they can maximize those members' consent to the demanded lifestyle. On top of that, they also exert pressure on their members to undermine attachment to other institutions or persons making demands that conflict with theirs. This could mean, for example, prohibiting sexual or familial relationships, removing the separation between the private and the public sphere, or socially uprooting their members through geographic mobility. The vocational work ethic postulated by Weber paves the way for self-exploitative work practices that are increasingly exploited by academic institutions governed by neoliberal imperatives of competition, flexibility and productivity, as well as the logics of project work, managerialism and audit. Nowadays, academics not only face increasing pressure to be internationally mobile, but also to produce high and measurable work output. As a professor put it, to be employable in this day and time is to be able to do everything. You have to prove that you can teach very well, supervise very well, you can publish very well, and that you can attract funding. It's almost as if you're supposed to be able to do everything, isn't it? It's not a double bind. It's clearly a quadruple bind or whatever you want to term that. It does make you vulnerable because you have to do all these things at the same time. The PhD students sense that and that is what makes their heart jump. The thought that it's not just good enough to write a good thesis. That is a bit scary, isn't it? A telling example for this intensification of demands is a one-day introductory course for PhD candidates at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Copenhagen. In this course, the participants were told by a leading representative of the graduate school that they should be happy, that they can spend most of their time doing research, as they would not have this much freedom again when they get a research position. They heard this just after they had been told that they were expected to teach, disseminate their research and establish networks, both with, within and beyond academia, participate in the working life of their department, as well as collaborate across departments and even faculties visit a foreign university and do field work trips for at least two months and, of course, finish on time. In line with this, they were reminded at the Department of Anthropology that although they were privileged to have three years to focus on a topic, those three years would pass quickly and they had better not exceed that time limit. Therefore, they should work off the 420 hours of work they owe the department as soon as possible while doing the obligatory coursework, corresponding to six months of studies conducting fieldwork of a standard duration of eight to 12 months, being an active, active part of the department by attending meetings, research seminars and researcher groups, and have some publications when they finish. Considering this, it is not surprising that a PhD candidate left the aforementioned introductory course with the impression that it was so absurd that at the introductory day, 
They repeat it so many times throughout that day. These are going to be the best three years of your life, where they were listing all this stuff that we had to do. In fact, the pressures to live up to the high demands tied to, to their allegedly privileged positions were experienced by some PhD candidates as burdensome to such an extent that they reported of having nightmares. They recount the dreams of being stoned to death at a department meeting for secretly considering quitting or of being unexpectedly called to defend your thesis, trying to run away, but being dragged back by, back by the department staff again and again. A professor offered the following explanation for the intensification of performance pressures. I think we're demanding a lot now, and that's because there's more competition, so you can dem demand more, because there are more people around to apply for those positions than there were 20 years ago. This view was confirmed by an interlocutor in a managerial position who explained to me that to get the position, you compete with others, and you see others become even more qualified during time. You really have to look at those people who have just become professors. What have they done? And if you wait, you will see that the next professors have published even more, attracted even more funding, and have even better teaching evaluation. It's a moving target. We work very hard so that the standard increases. And one way to increase the standard is to have the whole world apply for a position here. In that sense, we as university leaders really try to push so it becomes even harder to become a professor. Performance pressures are furthermore intensified by the fact that academics can never quite know whether the work is good enough when facing an assessment. In that regard, another person in a managerial position at the same university remarked that even professors never know whether they are doing well enough. All scientific staff here are very no nervous about whether they are good enough at teaching and at research. And I cannot set up criteria specifically for each group of employees because I don't know either when they are good enough. It's always dependent on who the other applicants are. I think that that's just, in a sense, a burden for all academics. But it's also a driving force because we want to improve all the time. Of course, the line between wanting and having to improve is a thin one in, a con in contem contemporary academia, and such a burden, although shared by junior and senior academics alike, weighs all the heavier on those without permanent contracts whose future employment is dependent on the highly uncertain outcome of such assessments. This brings me to a second feature of the contemporary university. While academics face rapidly rising performance pressures, their employment security is equally rapidly dismantled. Although it is still unlikely for academics to be dismissed, it has become significantly more likely for them to lose their position, as more and more of them are employed on temporary contracts. For example, an inquiry to the Austrian Ministry of Science, Research and Economy re revealed that in 2015, 78.4% of all academic staff at Austrian universities were employed temporarily. On the other hand, the number of permanently employed academics under 41 years, excluding project staff and external lecturers, had dropped by 61.3% to 16.5% between 2005 and 2014. Whereas 94.7% of all job holders in Austria aged between 31 and 40 had a permanent position in 2014. It is this additional pressure of insecure employment that primarily affects early career academics, a group that in effect comprises of academics with 10 years of work experience or even more. This extension of the period of temporary employment does not only further the intensification of performance pressures, it simultaneously raises a growing concern that early career researchers risk becoming a source of cheap labor without stable employment contracts and worse, without sound career perspectives, according to Science Europe. This is especially the case since those temporary contracts often go hand in hand with part-time employment and lower salaries. In that regard, Bousquet argues that precarious working conditions are not a malfunction of the university system, but exactly what its functioning is based on. The continuous replacement of degree holders with non-degreed labor, or persons with degrees willing to work on unfavorable terms. Referring to the US higher education system, he concludes that the holders of doctor degree are not so much the products of the graduate employee labor system as its byproducts. That is, they are the waste product of a university system that creates holders of the PhD 
but doesn't have much use for them. In that case, and in returning full circle to the beginning of this paper, the question arises, if performing at the highest level possible, regardless of the actual remuneration, is at the heart of the system, what remains of the pursuit of an academic career if that desired gratification fails to materialize for the vast majority of early career academics? In that regard, I argue that the combination of a vocational work ethic with increasingly greedy performance pressures and precarious working conditions constitutes a convenient conjuncture for the employers of academics. It allows them to ask for much while having to offer little in return. That is, they can siphon off the high outputs of their employees on or underpaid work. As a professor put it, the universities have worked all of this out. The poster category itself is structurally designed to get people working like crazy because there is no job security. You're basically borrowing an office in a department and the department and the university is getting all the credit because you're really in your prime in terms of early stage publishing. You're publishing a lot. So the university is getting all the credit, but they can say no strings, at, strings attached here. Of course, constructing a dichotomy between exploitative senior and exploited junior academics would be too simplistic. After all, although the privileges of tenured staff are bought at the expense of the un or undervalued labor of the equivalent of the academic proletariat, the overworked permanent staff and the undervalued casual staff are two sides of the same coin, to use Barkin's words. However, with the line between commitment and exhaustion, or between, or between support and exploitation, becoming increasingly thin in today's hyper-competitive and hyper-productive university context, young academics in particular left in a most vulnerable position. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. I think this uh, presentation also brings us back to the first pre presentation of this plenary, to the question of relations and emotions, and also the demands of personal investments of a greedy vocation and a greedy institution, as Christian has described it. And now it's time for the comments by Vita Peacock, um, who we're also ha happy to have accepted the role as discussant. Vita is a postdoctoral teaching associate at Girton College, Cambridge. Her PhD was a study of hierarchy in the Max Planck Society, and she's now working on a book about the anonymous movement in Britain to be published by University of Ch Chicago Press. Um, as this is the final plenary, I just want to take a brief moment to thank our Swedish hosts uh, for a really wonderful, fantastic feast of a conference that's been so pleasurable in so many ways. Um, but to the papers. Um, these papers, all four sets of papers, uh, reflect a growing interest by a younger generation of anthropologists in the articulations of precarity within academia itself, an interest which for many is also autoethnographic. Um, and I'm grateful to Christian for pointing out how precarity may be affecting many people in this room, given that um, participation in academic conferences constitutes one of the many forms of unpaid labor in academia, albeit labor that comes with a huge number of social and psychological rewards. And it's this kind of ambivalence, um, this kind of coexistence of potentially contradictory truths that, that comes across very strongly in the two papers we've just heard. Barrera, in his study of South Asian social scientists building an academic career in Europe, documents the privileged position that many of his interlocutors inhabit. They themselves are uh, almost unilaterally from upper middle class um, fam families. Um, enjoy access, as many of us do, to uh, the lavish resources of elite institutions, um, and have access to, to the various forms of capital, um, economic, social, and Theo brought up this idea of symbolic capital, which is very important, that this kind of cosmopolitan subjectivity gives them. Um, at the same time, he tells us, they live in a constant fear of downward mobility, have anxieties about not being settled in one place, and suffer in some cases from mental health problems. 
Rogler, in his study of two anthropology departments in Austria and Denmark, notes the co-presence of contradictory discourses around precarious academia. On the one hand, an old idea of academic work as a vocation persists, yet this is shot through with a dictatorial logic in order to meet the demands of what he calls um, a greedy institution. And we keep using this word because I think it's a really great, <laughs> quite provocative way of describing a university as greedy, as almost, it almost anthropomorphizes the university. Um, precarity is, um, has been very, very ubiquitous at this conference. Um, and it's a word we hear a lot and it's used in lots of different ways and that's always sort of what happens with these popular tropes. Um, but I think one of the things we can offer as anthropologists through the ethnographic method um, is to, to really draw out the nuances and um, the, the forms of cultural particularity which inflect the experience um, of precarity, um, which potentially problematizes uh, a kind of understanding of precarity as, as affect. I mean, can we talk about precarity as a universal affect? I mean, as an anthropologist, I'd be, I'd be hesitant about that, um, but that's maybe a debate we can have towards, towards the end. Um, but this is the essence of my question for Ferrero. Um, you raise a very interesting historical question around the way that contemporary asymmetries of precarity are being mapped onto what were once imperial relationships, um, particularly between India and the UK. Um, at the same time, you have a particular, uh, as you say, ethnographic focus on Germany, uh, which obviously has a slightly different historical relationship to South Asia. Um, so, this is obviously a massive question, but um, can, you, can you chart in any way how the cultural experience of South Asians in Germany might be different to their experience in the UK? Um, and can you clarify the nature of that difference? Um, I mean, just to give an example of my own work in Germany, um, the scientists every so often would describe themselves as scientific Gastarbeiter, which obviously explicitly draws on this, um, this German labor history of uh, precarious, drawing precarious labor from Southern Europe and Turkey in the 60s and 70s. Um, and the, but the scientific, but the Gastarbeiter phenomenon in Germany was also preceded by previous historical instantiations of precarity in Germany. For instance, at the end of the 19th century, you have large swathes of Polish agricultural workers who are crossing the border um, to work on the farms, or on, on, the, on the estates of Prussian Junkers, who, who would come um, for, as a form of seasonal labor um, and then return to Poland. So there's these very, very long historical trajectories of um, precarity uh, globally, and they, they all manifest in, in slightly different ways, and it would be good to hear about potentially some of those differences. Um, and I'd like to turn to Rogler's paper. Rogler draws on Max Weber's famous essay, Science as a Vocation, to expound on how this vocational idea of academia has become, as he says, highly problematic in today's institutional context in the face of mass casualization and exploitative working conditions. And some of the statistics you offered at the end were absolutely shocking. I mean, this drop of 61% to 16%, I mean, this is a massive structural changes are taking place um, in, in the context that you're looking at. Um, but I just want to pause for a moment on this, this idea of the vocation um, and its own particular history. Um, in Weber's essay, it's obviously a translation of the German Beruf, which comes from the stem, stem Ruf, uh, a call, a calling. It's a calling, and um, as we know from Weber's other work on, um, on Protestantism, um, it has its roots uh, as, a, as a theological notion to explore, um, to, not to explore, to, to articulate the idea of an individual responding to a summons from God. Um, you know, so it, the, the behoof, the vocation has this 
wonderfully volunteerist aspect at its heart. It's the idea of something happening within you and you are literally moved to act in this particular way. Um, and I think this comes out possibly more in the, um, in the written version of the paper, was how, <laughs> how paradoxically imperative this discourse of vocation um, has become, which totally undermines its, these original theological roots. Um, so PhD students are being told that they are privileged. Um, they're being informed that they would never have this much freedom again. Um, that they literally should be happy. Um, and it's interesting because it's a, it's a complete contradiction of the volunteerist idea of the vocation in which you're being drawn out. Um, you know, being told you should be happy is, yeah, it's quite something. Um, and at the same time, when the PhD students themselves use vocational language, they sound highly sarcastic. Um, and they sort of say, oh, we've got this fantastic thesis and wonderful ideas, and it all sounds extremely ironic. Um, and the only people in your ethnography who seem to be using this vocational discourse in um, the way it would have been historically understood are the professors. And so my question to you is, um, uh, which is also a kind of, uh, is there a bud of hope within this situation as well? Are there precarious academics uh, among the people that you work with who still um, hold on to this, this volunteerist idea of the vocation, um, not in an ironic or sarcastic way, but in an authentic way? Um, or has this been entirely eclipsed by meeting the exigencies of precarity and the greedy institution? Um, I also wonder, too, on this point, whether there is um, a, a risk of being slightly romantic about the context in which Weber himself was writing um, when he writes these essays on vocation, on sciences of vocation. Um, as we know from the excellent book by Fritz Ringer, um, the late 19th and early 20th century Germany was a time of profound crisis for the German university system, in some ways more extreme than, than the one we see today. And it was to this crisis that Weber was also speaking. So there's also, um, uh, can be this kind of amnesia around precarity and actually um, it's helpful to, uh, to think about echoes with the historical past rather than precaritization as something which just sort of happens after the 1980s. Um, and just to, just to sort of um, round things up, we saw at the, I don't know how many of you were at the AGM yesterday, um, but precarity has become um, a really ex explosive topic um, for all of us, and it's one that IASA has focused on, um, particularly at this conference. Um, and uh, the IASA survey that was carried out actually showed that a whopping 75% of members, of IASA members, are in some form of precarious situation, which is, you know, which is a supermajority, um, which sort of echoes actually the 78.4% um, that, that you were citing in the Austrian study. Uh, so this is three quarters of members are now precarious. I mean, this is a huge demographic truth. Um, and so obviously there's a strong move for us um, as anthropologists to, to mobilize against this. And this is one, uh, something I think my, everyone would support. Um, but just in the spirit of uh, exploration, I just want to play devil's advocate here and to use these ethnographies to highlight some of the moral ideas that still circulate within academia that maybe obstruct or inhibit uh, particular kinds of mobilization around precarity. And the first, I think, which comes across in all four papers is this really profound non-instrumentality through which many academics relate to their work. Genuine feelings of love, of passion, of enthusiasm, of vocation, um, draw people into these professions in the first place. So these feelings, these, these authentic feelings, mean that perhaps you feel lucky, you know, as, as one of um, Ferreira's informants said, they feel lucky, you know. You, many people in the world don't enjoy their jobs, and, you know, this fact that you feel lucky can inhibit maybe a form of political consciousness. Um, I'll just try and be a bit quicker. Um, the second is these very, this very long historical tradition of mobile scholarship. Um, I mean, this is potentially 
going back to, you know, this is going back to the medieval period and the circulation of scholars through monasteries. Um, there's a very, very, very ancient idea of, of the scholar as someone who travels, and that's one that, again, you see in all the ethnographies. Um, the third is, and I think this is a particular problem in the natural sciences, is of um, scholars not seeing themselves, their work or their position as political. Um, I mean, potentially, there is a huge disciplinary dis difference in this regard. Um, but in the natural sciences, you have very, very low rates of unionization and political action. And many of the scientists that I interviewed did not see their position as a political one. And obviously, that is inhibiting particular kinds of consciousness. Um, and finally, and this is probably the most contentious one, in, is, is this idea of meritocracy. Um, you know, people who become academics are people who have exhibited, um, have done well in their exams, have exhibited a talent for processing complex information. Um, and there is this, this insidious idea that if you don't somehow uh, get this, this permanent position, then it's a failure with you. Um, and so it taps into this general discourse of responsabilization in which the individual becomes responsible for their own um, structural failures. Um, but I think as all the statistics are showing, precaritization is becoming a new norm. Um, so you really cannot say that that's the case. Um, so I just want to thank all of the, the panelists for, for doing this great work and really showing us the complexity of the problem that we're up against. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vita. So now if you want to just quickly respond and then we have to move on to the Q&A. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, regarding the differences uh, between German and British uh, contexts, uh, as I said, the first of them is in terms of expectations. I think that those who go to uh, to the UK, they 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 nourish this expectation about staying in the UK and building a career there, whereas those who are going to, uh, to Germany, they don't normally. They realize very quickly that uh, Germany is a kind of hub of passage. They are there for four years and are, they are not supposed to stay there for longer. Uh, there is a difference of language too. It's, I think it's, it's really important. Uh, many of my interlocutors who stay in Germany, if sometimes for three, four years, they don't learn German at all, for example, and, uh, and I think that this creates a relationship to the place which is different and uh, we, we, can talk, we can think in terms of this integration to the academia in Germany, uh, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, relation, in, in, uh, there is a rationality, so uh, relationality, so they don't learn but they don't get integrated because they don't talk German too. Uh, and also there are the difference in terms of networks. Uh, the, the, the British uh, networks that get them there uh, normally are more uh, prestigious and historically uh, known networks, Cambridge, Oxford. Not all of them, but uh, very often the people I met, they, they, they went to, they arrived the UK through these very prestigious Commonwealth scholarships, etc., which, which connect networks in the UK and India. Whereas in, 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 in Germany, you have this kind of traditional prestigious networks too. South Asian Institute in Heidelberg, for example, was founded in 62, so it's a kind of is a quite old institution in, in terms of fair rate studies. Uh, but uh, there are some places in Germany that, are that were recently founded uh, yeah. I uh, that uh, promote more democratic circulations in terms of class and caste. And I think this, this, is, this is being important. Yeah, so I don't have. All right, so to get back to your question, if there's a risk of uh, romanticizing Bebas University, I mean, there certainly is. Um, there are many problems also with this kind of university. Um, but that's not the point I'd like to make because w what I want to s point out again is, is the matter of uh, what you call the co-presence of contradictory discourses. 
Um, and when you look at uh, what is the task of a university, what is the mission, what a university is for, there has been, been more and more missions added to this. To this. Uh, we have terms now like the schizophrenic university that Chris Shaw uses. So it's unclear what a university is for, um, and therefore it's also unclear what the job of academics should be. Should it be to do excellent research? Should it be to generate uh, value to help the, the local economy? Should it be to, to be inclusive and to educate as much uh, uh, as a bigger percentage of the population as possible. And uh, I'd like to conno connect this statement with your question, if there's a bit of hope. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure that there is uh, early career academics and academics who follow this volunteerist idea of the work. Mm -hmm. And that's also what I've often been told. This is something I do this because I like to do it. And then often the freedom comes in, uh, also because I, I have a certain flexi freedom, often in a sense of flexibility. But I think that this part of hope is exactly the problem. Mm. Um, because you have people who are intrinsically motivated, and then they, they meet um, uh, demands that are not, th or that, that, that contradict their, their um, intrinsic motivation. Mm. Thank you, Gabriela, for chairing this second session. Now I would like to invite all the presenters on the stage and also the discussants. As promised, we will have, uh, uh, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, thank you also, Vita and Theo, for the very stimulating set of thoughts and for opening, let's say, the, the floor to, to the questions. Of course, the topics of discussion are, ma are many, according to what it has been said until now, but I won't, I will stop here and I will uh, take questions from the audience. So please be concise uh, on your questions. Uh, so be concise in your comments, uh, questions, uh, or experiences concerning your uh, personal experiences. I already see someone there, please. Um. Uh, please hi. introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Alicia Tilke. I work at the LSC in, in the UK. Um, thank you very much for, um, for this. I personally found um, the panel quite problematic in the sense that I, I think it probably comes out of an effort from the part of the EASA to deal with the issue of precarity. Um, but I, I found the sort of academicizing of, of the whole um, question um, that a, a problem that I think is in a way is... is uh, not bringing us a solution, and this, this is something that happened also in the whole how uh, debate, that suddenly we create all this very academic paper that put the issue at a big distance from us, and, and I, found this, uh, I find this a, a, a big problem, and something that we should uh, maybe be thinking about more. Uh, the second question is to do with the last two papers, uh, and maybe with, with in, in more in general with the, this idea of uh, precarious privilege or, or that um, uh, you know, uh, many of us uh, are in positions of privilege in the sense that we may have families uh, or we may come from uh, middle class families and have resources um, uh, behind us. The point is that I think a lot of people slip out of the system, you know, those who don't have that privilege slip out of the system before, so we then create an academia which you know, which is made of more, more and more privilege because in order to sustain postdoc after postdoc and gaps between postdocs, you do need to have privilege. But, but I think that, you know, that, that's not the point. So. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, and thanks, Alice, for, Alice, for the comment. I wanted to discuss more, more specific issues around the gendered um, question, which I find interesting because on the one hand, kind of, of course, the men didn't quite mention. Um, whereas Martin spoke about, but I didn't quite see what was the gender thing in the discussion that she said, except that people lose their relational connections. Um, and I want to kind of push the gendered dimension of precarity a bit further, and to speak also a bit about the passion issue. So we have a huge gender pay gap in academia. We also have 80 or 70% of most professorships, not in anthropology, but across are given to men. Uh, we have women dropping out of academia at very large age uh, rates, especially around the age of 30, 35, which is after the PhD. Uh, they dropped out, especially of research positions, uh, like postdocs 
in, in terms of gender gap diminished twice, like we, women drop out. Usually that's related to women staying stable at some place and trying to raise a family because there's also a very strong gendered expectation that women should be the ones that care. That comes with a, a lot of very strong normativity, but also with a lot of uh, lack of, uh, for instance, maternity leaves within projects and so on and so forth. Um, and then there is the whole masculinist idea of who can move and who, who couldn't move. There was a very good uh, sociology paper, but of course most of us don't read sociology, so we don't know about it. Um, there is uh, a paper that was recently in the Sociological Review about how um, juries make decisions about um, gendered appointments. And it was shown that uh, single unpartnered women and men are given huge privilege because there are a lot of assumptions that are being made about the partner of women who move without women being asked about it. Um, so then the, the other thing is how do partners invest in this gendered academia. I mean, a lot of us are middle class or are uh, kind of, as, as Vinicius's paper showed, aspiring middle class, which means also a specific type of parenting, which is parenting that uh, feeds into an upper mobility, as, as you pointed out. Um, that upper mobility goes with a very specific understanding of, of how settled you are, how much money you give into extracurricular activity, how much of your time after work you give to parenting, which of course then brings me, and I'm closing here, to the question of passion and to what, what, what is work worth doing. And of course one of the privileges that we have as possibly social scientists, anthropologists, academics, is that we identify a lot with our work. And that's, that's work on academics and on, on certain types of professions that have been shown. And, and in a way, what we have been doing, however, and we are not discussing here, is how this passion is actually used a lot to exploit us. Again, in sociology, there is a very um, recent paper, actually it's two years ago, by uh, Paola Rivetti and Sandro Busso, which is called What's Love Got to Do With It? And it's about ac Italian academics and the way that especially middle-class academics can afford to maybe live with their parents for a few years and work for free in order to feed into the food chain. But at the same time, of course, working class academics can't, you know, people from poorer families can't afford to do. So we are feeding into this system very clearly. And what's very important, uh, coming back again to Vinicius's paper, is that, you know, I, I remember I was from a Marie Curie network of uh, PhDs that was Eastern Europeans go to the West uh, or go to study other parts of the world because we've been doing anthropology of home too, too much. And uh, after that network finished, um, a few of us were very bitter because we were, oh, we were promised a life in the West and now we are not given the chance to really stay there in a good position. But at the end of the day, it's a bit like the promise of 1989. I mean, if we believe that capitalism is gonna be good, we were fools. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the short version would be what happened to social classes. But um, to make it a bit longer, only the third paper actually referred to social class, but with exclusive reference to the middle class. And so I would I'll ask, uh, is it really possible to develop a critical reflection, as you put in the title, on precarity without inquiring the ways exclusion works across dynamics of class, along, of course, with gender, race, etc.? Is it really possible to articulate a reflection on precarity without even referring to the fact that uh, in many contexts, the academic system still has a strong bourgeoisie configuration that makes it impossible for lo the lower classes to access at academic positions? Uh, my feeling is that if uh, it is not possible to integrate uh, the analysis of social class into an analysis of, the, uh, of precarity, uh, the result will be uh, a concern of the middle and uh, upper classes uh, regarding uh, historical privilege that have been consolidated to the detriment of the lower classes. And that would be a missed opportunity. Thank you, Antonio. Please, Theo, could you please reply to the first question? Pleasure. Um, uh, I would mainly reply to the first and the, and the third uh, comment that I both find very interesting and very engaging. And in fact, I had it. Um, I, I personally uh, pointed out to the fact of, of privileged mobility and to the, to the point of class, and I think it's central, as uh, it's uh, central in what uh, Alice uh, has pointed out to, towards, which is the intellectualization, you know, this wordiness, this uh, 
this strive when we talk politically to make all these scholarly um, points. And you know, I want, I'm going to quote from two people I really appreciate. The first is Elvis Presley that says a little less conversation, a little more, more action. And the second is Perry Anderson, who's uh, in India's book on Western Marxism, he critiques everyone after the first generation, everyone after Luxembourg and Trotsky and whatnot. So Althusser, Sartre, De La Volpe, etc. And he says, why has Western Marxism failed? Why is Gramsci the only person that we still take seriously from Western Marxism? Because he had skin in the game like the first generation of Marxists. He was part of social movements, he, he came from poverty, um, and he didn't pursue an academic life. Althusser did, and his relevance is less important than, than Gramsci's. My point is that if there is no talk of unionism, there's no talk of um, organizing uh, precariously employed people, and there's all, only academic reflection on our own academic position as precarious workers, is this, this, this an internal contradiction that could only lead to more intellectualization and less um, solid sort of um, potential change? Thank you. We had also the question on gender dimension. Um, Martin, if you want to reply, or the others. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that you p pointed out also all the literature about gender in sociology or other fields. And I think one important issue here is like gender kind of underlies everything, right? It's you, you have sociologists who study it from a doing and doing, redoing perspective, other who focus more on the internalization process other who uh, study more the structure of organization. And it's all those perspectives who have to come together to really uh, give an overall, overall picture. And then maybe then I'll link with the first person who also um, said she was disappointed because there were not, not even enough recommendation or like applied results. I think, of course, uh, it's great to use our analytical minds to, to analyze the issue, but um, I, I find that this sort of overanalyzing can also pose a great distance between, the, between us and the issue, especially in some of the papers. Yeah, I found even the presentation, you know, the, the performance or, or whatever, you know, the way <laughs> like the, the presentation was delivered, like it, it's like a, there is a huge sea between what you're talking about and, 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 and where you are. So I think this is something that is affecting all of us and, and I think we, we have to, of course, use analysis, but let's think how, maybe. Regarding the idea of privileged precarity, it's, uh, it's an idea that my interlocutors themselves, they, they, re they, they rose. Uh, they see themselves as privileged people. And uh, we have to understand that the Indian, in the Indian when, we, when we talk about middle class in India, we are not talking about middle class as we understand it in Europe. Middle class in, in Europe is the, the worker class, whereas more the, uh, middle class in India, such as in Latin America, for example, is a privileged class. It's a class who, uh, which has social and political and economic privileges, and they are very aware of that. When I'm talking to them, we're talking about their own privileges all the time. Uh, so uh, this is uh, why, and they know that the networks that connect them between India and Europe are very high-profile networks. Uh, and uh, in this sense, I, I wanted to emphasize this also, and this is, this is connected to the question of, of class, because and uh, the bourgeoisie in academia, I, I completely agree, uh, to today academic life is a very bourgeoisie life. And uh, in, in some extent, this is uh, my, my, what I'm trying to do is a critique of that. It's, uh, it's very clearly a, a critique of how elites are reproduced in academic life. And I think that precarization plays a very important role in that. I think that we are most, more and more dependent on hierarchical and uh, charismatic kinds of relationships with big, big, persons ha leading big projects con where, where money is more and more controlled by less and less people in academia. 
and, we, and our, our careers depend on building up on these relations, and it, it implies moral economies, it implies uh, a kind of a set of relations that are class biased, in my view, and gender biased, and caste biased, and the networks of these people are very caste and class biased. What 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 makes difficult to to build a career when you come from low caste or low class or and we talked about gender too. I, uh, it's uh, these net these South Asian networks are very male dominated. It's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to connect to different things to, to, for, for the sake of time, but uh, yeah. Uh, so solving the problem, I think, um, I think there's more happening than there kind of appears to be on the surface, um, because so much of, certainly in my experience, so much of the discussions that go on are very kind of segregated from mainstream academia. So I don't, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of talking about just what's happening in this kind of forum um, because of that. Because I, I mean, certainly from my experience in Australia, I think that a lot of permanent academics just aren't aware of what's, what's happening at all. And um, I, so I think it is necessary to have these kind of conversations. I get the sense that things are a little bit different in Europe because, I mean, just going on the number of um, panels on precarity here has been really great because, I mean, in Australia, there's just nothing. <laughs> Um, except at our upcoming conference, which actually has a couple. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, the kind of things that are happening in Australia. So, um, to give an example, uh, our union branch at my university, the University of Western Australia, um, recently had an election and our union for the entire university, this is for academics and for professional staff, um, everyone, um, has gone from having one person in a precarious position representing, um, I think, a panel of 12, that's, there's 12 people on it, to having almost half. So I think that is really important um, and the, really, really telling about, yeah, the shift that's going on, even though it might not be as noticeable on the surface of this. Anyway, uh, I think I'll leave it at that because I've probably taken more than my time. I was very much reminded to yesterday evening when uh, a, a person from the audience said, well, what, what is the meaning of doing a survey? Uh, and you have to have a, a, a comparative approach and uh, there is no real sample. So you can uh, criticize uh, very basic work uh, and, and it's a, a similar critique to say, well, why, why do you actually academicize uh, the topic by bringing it to a panel. And I would answer to both these critiques that it is both meant to build on political position making and decision making. So it's contributions to discussions and it should be public. And that's why we thought it's important to have also those researches that are already out there. So it was not initiated, but it was taken up what is already out there. Uh, in order to bring it together and have an, an additional opportunity to discuss it. So I think both uh, and efforts, a survey or different ethnographic studies are brought together and in order to build uh, on political statements on this issue. So thank you for giving us the time to discuss these things. Hi, and um, thanks for your, for your well-informed um, talks. Um, however, there's one thing I found um, strangely absent, namely the um, students or talking about the, the students when talking about precarity in academia, since I figure as an undergraduate um, that precarious working conditions in academia directly relate to precarious teaching conditions and the students might um, suffer under that um, too. So my question, I think, is somewhat um, twofold. On the, other, uh, on the one hand, I think I would like to ask you, how do you think might we be able to build solidarity between the students and um, precariously employed teachers at the university? Um, and how that might relate to um, establishing what Judith Butler would call um, practices of translation because our struggles might be somewhat different, but in the end, 
they relate to one common goal, I guess. I mean, a better education for a better world to come. And in the end, it might not be um, a question of, um, or a framework of questioning the structure, but I think in the end it will come down to opposing the structure. And I think if the teachers and the students stand in solidarity, we actually do wield the political and discursive power to change something. And I would like to hear your thoughts on that. This is uh, everyone's fight. Uh, it should be precarity in academia. Uh, students, professors, uh, teachers who are in precarious positions, and especially teachers who are already in stable jobs. Because, uh, so it's, I mean, it's everyone's uh, issue here, I think. And uh, l let's remember that public policies are not written by the president no, or the Ministry of Education. Pre uh, pol public policies are written by scholars, by researchers who work for governments. So uh, what is happening is, is everyone's responsibility, I think. I think one of the barriers to getting students involved is the fact that people are often ashamed of being precarious and therefore don't share with their students their um, employment circumstances when they're teaching. Um, and that's completely understandable. Um, uh, just an observation from um, something that was going on at my university. Uh, we had kind of a round, of, well, the, the first and only round of um, mass firings um, of permanent staff, uh, I think it's two years ago now. And um, there was a series of protests coming out of this, and I found it really fascinating that the people who were protesting were not the permanent staff, but the students and the precarious staff, um, which was just bizarre to me. So I think to some extent it may already be happening um, more than we think. Like totally in agreement. Um, uh, just two thoughts. Uh, we should eliminate the dear professor uh, kind of uh, attitude, which is thankfully is less pronounced here in Europe than in the US. Uh, when uh, precariously employed people that travel across states for many, many years in, in teaching positions of two of, of that last two years um, are called professors and that thus sort of reinforcing this ideologized, obfuscating um, uh, sense that they are in positions of standing when in fact they are uh, precarious. And the second uh, thought is we shouldn't take it for granted that w we, that they have, that, that is the students, uh, as, um, an obligation to be on, on the side of this kind of struggle because we have to, you know, uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted. It, uh, it mm -hmm. Trust has to be won in the amphitheater by doing good job. That's by doing our jobs. And, um, and that's how solidarity is built, through labor, but also good labor, labor that we like to do. Um, I think the challenge is in a way, the qu or the problem is the question of continuity because um, you have a very high turnover in, in, in academia among students particularly, also amongst precariously employed academics. You have people being at the institution for a year or less. Um, and that, I think that's uh, one of the big challenges how to organize around it. In Austria, there have been huge, in many countries, uh, countries there have been huge uh, protests where students were highly engaged, precarious academics were engaged. And then I have the impression that they, they, after a few weeks or months, they, they, they thin out. And I think, yeah, that's an important issue how to, ma because management, policy makers, senior staff, they are there for a long time. Um, whereas students often, and, and also precarious uh, workers are not. So I don't have an answer, but I think this is uh, one unimportant matter to address when, when asking how to, uh, to create more solidarity am among, among uh, university members. Of course, uh, I'm going to close with this word solidarity. It's very important. Everything started, as Sabine has said, with uh, the pre country group when they asked to join our forces and to fight against precarity, a precarity that affects not the precarious scholars, but also the established scholars. There is no solution, there is no recipe, as I said at the very beginning, but we have to go towards a political action and see what can be done 
at a, at a higher level. Of course, there are differences from one country to another, from one continent to another, and all of us, we are in competition if ever we are running for permanent job position. And at that point, we have to question also the, the solidarity when we are one against the other. Yesterday, we spoke about this precarity observatory. This is one idea that came out two days ago within the IASA exec, and we, we intend to see what happens in all the other countries and try to think about precarity at different levels. We have done until now several activities, and this plenary, I might say, is an, a, an outcome of the seminar that we organized in Bern last November. Well, thank you for your presentations. Thank you, our discussants, for, uh, for their thoughts. And thank you for being here with us. Um, and enjoy the very last hours of this conference. Have a nice evening.